Good evening. Welcome to Wednesday Reflections. No, I'm not Pastor Jeff, but don't be alarmed. Um, Pastor Jeff is just fine. There's nothing wrong. Uh, I also have my, my co-worker here, Gatsby, and he is going to be sitting with us throughout this session. Um, the reason that I'm here is because after last week's session, Jeff and I were talking about the things that he talked about last week, comparison and conviction and condemnation. And while we were talking, uh, I, I made a comparison uh, or a, a suggestion of a scripture that backed up conviction, that demonstrated conviction. So uh, Pastor Jeff decided that maybe I should talk to you this week um, and I, I'll do my very best. Um, comparison. Just to review, comparison is dangerous for, for two reasons. Um, you either, if you compare yourself to someone and you find that you are, you find yourself better than they are, that you think you're stronger or better in some way, that leads us to feeling superior. Uh, you've, hear, you've heard of it as a superiority complex, um, and that that can be uh, dangerous because then we have pride and arrogance. We, be we become uh, somebody that we don't want to be. By the same token, um, if you compare yourself to someone else and you feel like you are less than they are, you don't measure up, you're inferior, um, then um, you're, you're tending toward an inferiority complex. And that's not good either. The, the best place for us to be is to compare ourselves to God's Word. That is what we're supposed to do, to look in the mirror of the Word. And we need to see who we are according to the Word. Um, I do have notes, by the way. Um, when I think of the word conviction, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight, um, I think of being convinced but I always look words up to make sure that I am interpreting them correctly. And so I looked up the word con convinced and conviction. And interestingly enough, when I looked up conviction, conviction is being convinced. There's a reason that I thought of those words together. So when we're convicted about something, God is trying to convince us of something. He wants us to see ourselves as we are. Um, conviction is, yes, I'm looking at my notes. Conviction is convincing a person of error or compelling the admission of truth. And those are two very important things that we need to do. God uses conviction to convince us of our sinfulness and to compel us to recognize and admit the truth that we need reconciliation with God. Um, now, all of this brought me to the story of the prodigal son. And that is in the chapter, uh, Luke, the book of Luke, chapter 15, 11 through 32. Um, in the beginning of Luke 15, there's this gathering of tax collectors and sinners. And their goal is to meet Jesus. So they come to meet Jesus, and they want to talk and interact with him. And, with him. and as they are talking and interacting with him, the Pharisees and the scribes who are hanging around get really upset and they, they are very disturbed that Jesus is spending time and eating a meal with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus' way of dealing with their criticism was to give three parables. The first parable is the parable of the lost sheep. It's about a guy who has a hundred sheep, and one of them is lost. And he goes out searching for his sheep until he finds it. And when he finds that sheep, he leaves the 99 behind now, but he goes and he finds that one sheep. And when he finds that sheep, sheep have this tendency when they're lost to just lay down and do nothing. And they'll die that way if, you go, if the shepherd doesn't find them. So the shepherd finds that sheep, and he picks him up, and he wraps him around his neck. He lays him across his shoulders because that sheep may have been there a while and he may be weak. 
The shepherd lovingly carries the sheep home. And as he goes home with his sheep, as he reaches his home, he calls out to his friends and neighbors, come celebrate with me, rejoice with me, for my sheep that was lost is found. Jesus tells the scribes and Pharisees, I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just or upright persons who need no repentance. Pretty straightforward. The second parable is about a woman that has 10 silver coins and she loses one of them. When she loses that one coin, she does what most of us do when anything valuable is missing. We start searching. She cuts on the light. She starts sweeping thoroughly, and she searches until she finds her coin. When she finds her coin, she calls her friends and neighbors around. She wants to celebrate, and she says, my coin that was lost is found. Rejoice with me. And then Jesus goes on to the third parable. The third parable is the parable of the prodigal son. And just in case you're wondering, prodigal means wasteful. Um, that parable begins with a man that has two sons. The first son that we hear about is the younger son. He goes to his dad and he says, Dad, I want my inheritance. Now in those days, a Jewish man could give his inheritance to his children before his death. The, this younger son would have gotten about a third of his father's wealth. So the young man goes and asks for the money, and the, the father gives it to him. The young man just hangs around a little while, not long, and pretty soon he's packing his bags to go because this was all about getting away from the father. This was all about following his own thinking and his own desires and his own wants. So the parable goes on to tell us, that the younger son takes off. He goes just as far, he gets just as far away from his father as he can to a far and distant land. And there, without the watchful eye of his father, he spends every last dime of that inheritance on an over-the-top lifestyle. And then, there comes a famine. He's got nothing left. The younger son is there. No help. Nowhere to turn. He doesn't, he doesn't have any resources now. So he goes to a citizen of that country. And he joins up with him. And he takes work from that citizen. And that citizen gives him the glamorous job of feeding pigs. Now the son is really vile. When, when you mention to the scribes and Pharisees that the son is feeding pigs, that they, they cringe. Because you see, the Jewish people were not supposed to have anything to do with pigs or pork. It was considered vile. It was, it was not anything that they were to have anything to do with. And so, here's a young man that not only has betrayed his father, wasted his fortune, but now, now he's, he's committed to the Jews almost an unpardonable sin. Pigs? And here's this young man. Nowhere to go, nothing to do. There, he's, he's, he can't do anything but do his job, which is feed the pigs. And as he's watching the pigs eat, he's so hungry, he could have, he could have really done with a little bit of those carob pods himself because his stomach is rumbling in emptiness. And he sits there and nobody gives him anything. And then, as he's thinking, the hunger pains intensify. He tries to distract himself and he starts thinking about home and his father. Now, he had a diminished view of his father. He, he thought his father was somebody who didn't know anything, somebody who wasn't wise, somebody who just didn't, just didn't understand. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? 
And so he sits there, but he begins to think about his father. And as he thinks about his father, it's not about the, the fact that his father doesn't know anything or isn't wise or isn't up with the times. He begins to think about his father's servants. And his father's servants have plenty to eat and, and more than they need. And as he thinks about those servants, a thought comes to him. He is convinced that he needs to go to his father's house because his father's house has plenty of food. That's the place he needs to be. He's done with where he is. It's a total loss. But he needs to be with his father. So he, he doesn't just sit there. He is so convinced, convicted of his wrong, that he prepares a speech. He says, I will say to my father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. This young man has been humbled. And he realizes he is convicted of his sin. So he, he doesn't just sit there. He gets up and he goes forward. He starts the long journey toward home. As he travels, and he begins, after many, many miles, to see some familiar sights along the roadside. Maybe his, he summons up a little strength and tries to move a little faster. Meanwhile, his father is looking down the road, yet again, looking off into the distance yet again. And as he looks off into the distance, he sees this little, tiny dot moving ever so slowly. And as the dot gets closer, he looks down the road and realizes that maybe could it be? Maybe this is his son. No, no. It's been too long. Too long, too far away. This is not his son. But then, but then he looks again. Maybe, maybe after all this time, as some time passes, and he continues to look down the road, and the dot gets bigger. He realizes that, yes, this is the younger son. And the father doesn't just stand there, just like you or I wouldn't stand there. The father begins to run toward his son, and as he runs, his steps get faster and faster. Now, the son when he realizes that there's someone coming toward him and it surely looks like his father, he slows down because he's not really sure about what kind of reception he's going to get. But the father isn't deterred. He runs full force and panting and gasping, he gets to his son. He wraps his arm. He snags his, him with his clothes with his arm and he wraps his arm around that son and he pulls him close, tight against his chest. And the stench of where the sun has been is all over the sun. But that doesn't deter the father. It doesn't matter. This is his son. And he draws him close to him and he holds him close. And the son, when he can catch his breath, he begins to say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And that's as far as the son gets. The father is shouting over the son's words and he's saying, bring the best robe and put it on my son. 
bring the ring and put it on his hand and sandals and put them on his feet. Go get the fatty calf, kill it. Make a feast, prepare. This my son that was dead is alive. This my son that was lost has been found. Can you imagine the scene? And think, then think about our Father, how He feels, our Heavenly Father, how He feels toward us. He created us. He loves us. He knows who we are. He knows who we are deep down inside. And it doesn't stop Him from loving us. It doesn't stop him from caring. And we, we tend to follow our own way, don't we? We tend to trust our own thinking and our own instincts and our own knowledge. And the truth is, we push his knowledge away. We push his word, the truth away. But we need to bring his word to our hearts. And when we do, we see ourselves and when we see ourselves, we don't need to run from the Father. There's not condemnation. God's not saying, get away from me. He's saying, come to me. Come to me. I see your brokenness. I see your heartbreak. I see your tears, your disappointment. I see your failures, your mistakes, your sin. I see it. I know about it. But I still want you. I still long for you. You are dear and important to God. We are his creation. He longs for a deep relationship with us. He longs for us to have a joyful, happy relationship with him, rejoicing. No life won't be perfect. And we will mess up again. But he says, come to me. Come to me. Don't ever fall for Satan's lie that he doesn't want you anymore. Don't buy into it. Don't let what Satan says cause you to leave the Father, to run from the Father. I've made many mistakes and had many failures in my life. Some so deep that I can't begin to even deal with them in my mind. But I have always found this, that no matter how far away I feel from God, the best thing for me to do is to run to Him. To fall at His feet, to pour my heart out to Him, to tell Him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. I have sinned against you. I am, I am no longer worthy to be called your child. And he says, come to me. Come to me. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Do not allow the enemy to bring condemnation to you. Let God's conviction draw us to him. We must let God's conviction draw us to him. And that's where we will find plenty acceptance, love. May I pray with you? Father God, I come to you humbly in the name of Jesus Christ, my Savior. Father God, you bore so much responsibility in bringing salvation to us, Lord. You Father God, 
you took responsibility for our salvation when we sinned in the Garden of Eden and walked away from you. You had a plan. You knew our plan wouldn't work, so you gave us your plan. And your plan cost you dearly. It cost you, Jesus, your precious son. But you were willing to pay that price to reconcile us to you. So I thank you, Father, for the price you paid. And I thank you, Jesus, for all that you bore, all that you endured for me, for us. I thank you that you gave yourself, you, went, you carried the weight of our sin to the cross and you bore it before the Father and you endured separation from the Father so that we could be reunited with you. That we could be reconciled. Thank you for that love. Lord, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice that feels like that there's no hope, that, they, that, that they've gone too far, that they fail too often, that the enemy has whispered, it's no use. You're done for. Lord, I pray that your convicting power will move upon them. Lord, that, that they will feel the depth of your love in this moment. That they will feel your arms reaching for them. And that they will feel you drawing them and that, Lord, that you will give them courage to surrender and submit to you and to find the safety of the Father's house, the safety of your arms. Lord, I thank you for this time with each and every person that, that's watching, and I pray your blessing upon them. I pray, Lord, that you would be with our nation right now. This, we are in this terrible time of mourning, grief, brokenness. We need you. And we call out to you. And we thank you because you are here. And you are at work. We can trust you. And Father God, we give you the praise and the honor and the glory for your goodness. It's in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I hope you have a blessed evening. We love you. You're dear and precious to us. Good night.